Hello everybody and welcome to this video which is kindly sponsored by Squarespace. This week we're upgrading my Ironclads gallery. At the moment you can see there's only a few pictures. They're quite big. Um, I used to like it but I don't anymore. So I'm going to edit the gallery and just hit the plus button there on the right and upload a ton more images. Now there may be one or two duplicates. I'll probably have to go through and sort that bit later and a couple of back of pictures that I don't need, let them upload. And now I'm going to edit section and I'm going to go with three columns. That's a nicer layout. And this widescreen format is chopping up a few of the pictures. So I'm also going to change the aspect ratio. And now some pictures are still chopped up, but not quite as many. And there's also some spacing issues. You know, there's quite a lot of white space between each photo. So after checking that everything's uploaded, I'm just going to reduce the amount of spacing so it's all a little bit neater and those pictures are just a little bit bigger in the preview. But if you're a little bit worried that, well, hey, isn't that cropping some of the pictures? Well, no, this is just a standard size preview because if you go to, say, this one and open a new tab, the whole picture is there ready for your viewing and download if you want, I guess. So if after all these little mini tutorials I've been doing, you think you could build a website for maybe ideally naval history purposes, but you never know, you might want to do it for some other reason, then head over to squarespace.com forward slash Drakinafel. You can get a free trial, and once you're ready, that little link will give you 10% off your first website or domain. So thanks once again to Squarespace for sponsoring the video, and on with the main show. As the War of 1812 worked its way through the first year, naval actions remained surprisingly sparse. On the 8th of October, Commodore Rogers sailed from Boston once again with a squadron of three frigates, President, United States and Congress, uh, plus the brig Argus. On the 12th, the force split up into three components. Argus and United States were heading off on their own separate courses, whilst President and Congress remained sailing together. The latter two failed to run down the 38-gun HMS Nymph, which proved the swifter vessel, but they did manage to take the Swallow, a small packet ship which was transferring cash and thus a very valuable prize that was worth $200,000 just in the cargo. They then captured a few merchant ships but failed to take the 36-gun HMS Galatea, which, although slightly slower than her pursuers, was still swift enough to remain ahead of them until nightfall and then slip away under the cover of darkness. Argus, meanwhile, managed to take half a dozen prizes before having to run for it when she encountered a British frigate squadron, and elsewhere, the sloop USS Wasp ran into the brig Frolic, capturing her after a close-fought action at point-blank range, which was forced on both ships since they were both largely armed with carronades, the final bow-raking salvo from Wasp sealing the deal in her favour. However, that whole endeavour proved to be for naught as a couple of hours later, whilst both crews were trying to piece their ships back together, the 74-gun HMS Poissetier, I think, rolled by and retook Frolic before easily overhauling Wasp, whose rigging was still badly shot up, and taking her as well. Then, on the 25th of October 1812, we come to the main event for this video. Commodore Decatur, or Decatur, I've heard both pronounced over in the States, was in command of the frigate USS United States, and on this day, a sail was spotted. This turned out to be the 38-gun HMS Macedonian, Captain John Carden commanding. Once again, both sides were carrying somewhat more than their rated armament. Macedonian is credited as carrying, as compared to her nominal 38-gun rating, 28 18-pounder long guns on her main gun deck, with an upper deck armament of 14 32-pounder carronades and two 9-pounder bow chasers for a total of 44 guns, not including a 12-pounder carronade that was primarily intended to be mounted in one of the ship's boats, although one or two sources claim she was carrying 48 guns, presumably some additional carronades. The United States, meanwhile, notionally a 44-gunner, was carrying 30 24-pounder long guns and 24 42-pounder carronades, and a couple of 24-pounder bow chasers, for a total of 56 guns. The greater number of guns and the overall larger size of the ship, the American vessel being around 20 foot longer and 5 foot wider, was reflected in their crew complements. Macedonian had 301 men aboard, whilst the United States carried 478, 
Although, again, some sources differ, giving slightly lower or slightly higher estimates in the United States' case. Unlike the previous frigate duel, no one could claim that Macedonian was old, worn, or lightly built. She was, in fact, pretty much fresh out of Woolwich Dockyard and had only been in service for a couple of years. But whilst Captain Dacre of the Guerrier had combat experience both as an officer and as captain under his belt before his encounter with Constitution, Carden, whilst he had seen action whilst working his way up through the ranks, appears to have never actually led a ship into battle prior to this event. Samuel Leach was a powder monkey aboard the Macedonian and wrote an extensive account of the battle. He didn't have a particularly good opinion of Carden, and perhaps with good reason. You'll recall Dacra had allowed his American crewmen to withdraw below the waterline when it turned out they were going to be facing off against their own countrymen, even if this meant that Guerrier would be down almost a dozen valuable crewmen. Whereas aboard the Macedonian, it's related that the Americans among our number felt quite disconcerted at the necessity which compelled them to fight against their own countrymen. One of them, named John Card, as brave a seaman as ever trod a plank, ventured to present himself to the captain as a prisoner, frankly declaring his objections to fight. That officer, very ungenerously, ordered him to his quarters, threatening to shoot him if he made the request again. Poor fellow. He obeyed the unjust command and was killed by a shot from his own countrymen. This fact is more disgraceful to the captain of the Macedonian than, spoiler alert, even the loss of his ship. It was a gross and palpable violation of the rights of man. The United States was heading roughly east-northeast, tacking against a wind that was heading south-southeast, when the Macedonian was spotted ahead and slightly to starboard. Unlike the previous combat, the British ship immediately hoisted all sail and bore down on the American ship, coming up on the starboard quarter, and at first looking like she might keep this course before either turning to rake the bow of the United States or passing her starboard battery to starboard battery. But Carden seemed to want to retain the weather gauge, and so he hauled his ship to starboard across the wind to try and stay windward of the US vessel. The United States, in turn, bore to starboard herself in order to get off a long-range salvo with her 24-pounder long guns, which would have a decisive advantage in a long-range engagement. The first salvo fell short, and so United States resumed an east-northeast course to try and close the range down a bit. Aboard the Macedonian, there was a brief reply, as Leach recounts. At last, we fired three guns from the larboard side of the main deck. This was followed by the command, Cease firing, you're throwing away your shot. Then came the order to wear ship, and prepare to attack the enemy with our starboard guns. Soon after this, I heard a firing from some other quarter, which I at first supposed to be a discharge from our quarterdeck guns, though it proved to be the roar of the enemy's cannon. What had happened was that the United States, whilst still roughly heading east-northeast, was occasionally turning east-southeast to loose a broadside when the guns were loaded. And after the first salvo landed short, the rest of them were broadly on target. Realising rather quickly that playing a long-range barrage fire game with an enemy that had more and bigger long guns than you was not really a winning idea, Carden now ordered his ship to haul around and sail southeast to try and close the distance as soon as possible, essentially having done a massive U-shaped arc exposing himself to enemy fire, whereas his first lieutenant, as related earlier, had wanted to bear southwest or south-southwest and close most of the distance whilst both ships were still bow on to each other. Decatur decided he could also play this game, gradually shifting course southwest to stay just ahead of the Macedonian, turning to port when his guns were loaded to let fly another salvo, and then when the British ship likewise hauled to port to reply with its starboard broadside, the United States would slip further southwest, angling its strong hull to absorb the incoming fire to the best effect. Gradually, the range began to close, and the United States' big carronades also came into play. Aboard the Macedonian, things weren't going quite so well. A strange noise, such as I've never heard before, next arrested my attention. It sounded like the tearing of sails just over our heads. 
This I soon ascertained to be the wind of the enemy's shot. The firing, after a few minutes' cessation, recommenced. The roaring of cannon could now be heard from all parts of our trembling ship, and, mingling as it did with that of our foes, it made a most hideous noise. By and by I heard a shot strike the sides of our ship. The whole scene grew indescribably confused and horrible. It was like some awfully tremendous thunderstorm whose deafening roar is attended by incessant streaks of lightning, carrying death in every flash and strewing the ground with the victims of its wrath. Only, in our case, the scene was rendered more horrible than that by the presence of torrents of blood which dyed our decks. The battle went on. Our men kept cheering with all their might. I cheered with them, though I confess I scarcely knew for what. Certainly there was nothing very inspiring in the aspect of things where I was stationed. So terrible had been the work of destruction round us, it was termed the slaughterhouse. Not only had we had several boys and men killed or wounded, but several of the guns were disabled. The one I belonged to had a piece of the muzzle knocked out, and when the ship rolled, it struck the upper deck with such force as to become jammed and fixed in that position. A 24-pound shot had also passed through the screen of the magazine, immediately over the orifice through which we passed our powder. The schoolmaster received a death wound. The brave boatswain, who had come from the sick bay to the din of battle, was fastening a stopper on a backstay which had been shot away when his head was smashed to pieces by a cannonball. Another man, going to complete the unfinished task, was also struck down. Another of our midshipmen also received a severe wound. A fellow named John, who for some petty offence had been sent on board as a punishment, was carried past me badly wounded. I distinctly heard large blood drops fall, pat, 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 on the deck. His wounds were mortal. Even a poor goat, kept by the officers for her milk, did not escape the general carnage. Her hind legs were shot off, and poor Nan was thrown overboard. Gradually, the speed of the Macedonian dropped until the United States found itself ahead of the British ship by quite some margin. And so Decatur cut across the Macedonian's path, wheeling his ship as his adversary passed by, crossing once again, now he that was aft of it, coming up it close in on the Macedonian's starboard side, executing perfect bow and stern raking turns in the process. The final scenes of the battle, which was scarcely ninety minutes old, were already playing out. Such was the terrible scene amid which we had kept on our shouting and firing. Our men fought like tigers, some of them pulled off their jackets, others their jackets and vests, while some, still more determined, had taken off their shirts and with nothing but a handkerchief tied around the waistbands of their trousers, fought like heroes. I also observed a boy named Cooper stationed at a gun some distance from the magazine. He came to and fro on the full run and appeared to be as merry as a cricket. The third lieutenant cheered him along occasionally by saying, Well done, my boy, you're worth your weight in gold. Grape and canister shot were pouring through our portholes like lead and rain, carrying death in their trail. A large shot came up against the ship's side like iron hail, shaking her to the very keel, or passing through her timbers and scattering terrific splinters, which did a more appalling work than even their own death-giving blows. The reader may form an idea of the effect of grape and canister when he is told that grape shot is formed by seven or eight balls confined to an iron and tied in a cloth. These balls are scattered by the explosion of the powder. Canister shot is made by filling a powder canister with balls, each as large as two or three musket balls. These also scatter with direful effect when discharged. What then, with splinters, cannonballs, grape and canister poured incessantly upon us, the reader may be assured that the work of death went on in a manner which must have been satisfactory even to the King of Terrors himself. Suddenly, the rattling of the iron hail ceased. We were ordered to cease firing. A profound silence ensued, broken only by the stifled groans of the brave sufferers below. It was soon ascertained that the enemy had shot ahead to repair damages, for she was not so disabled but she could sail without difficulty, whilst we were so cut up that we lay utterly helpless. Our head braces were shot away, the fore and main top masts were gone, the mizzen mast hung over the stern, having carried several men over in its fall, but we were in a state of complete wreck. A council was now held among the officers on the quarter-deck. Our condition was perilous in the extreme. Victory or escape was alike hopeless. Our ship was disabled, many of our men were killed, and many more wounded. 
The enemy would without doubt bear upon us in a few moments, and as such she could now choose her own position, and would without doubt rake us fore and aft. Any further resistance was therefore folly. So, in spite of the hot-brained Lieutenant Mr Hope, who advised them not to strike but to sink alongside, it was determined to strike our bunting. This was done by the hands of a brave fellow named Watson, whose saddened brow told how severely it pained his lion heart to do so. To me, it was a pleasing sight, for I had seen enough fighting for one Sabbath, more than I wished to see again on a weekday. His Britannic Majesty's frigate Macedonian was now the prize of the American frigate United States. Indeed, Cardin had essentially played his ship right into the Americans' hands, allowing Decatur to utilise every advantage that he had to hand, whilst also failing to keep Macedonian's gunners trained and drilled to the needed standards, as the American ship had proved capable of firing about twice as fast, and with more accuracy, than Macedonian. Total American losses were 7 killed and 5 wounded, whilst Macedonian had lost 43 killed and 61 wounded. Whilst the casualties were high, Macedonian, as a ship, was actually substantially intact. As mentioned, she'd lost her mizzenmast on the tops of the fore and mainmasts, but she still had plenty of sail to hoist, and it was possible to jury-rig further masts, and both crews were soon hard at work patching the many shot holes. After some initial bad feeling between the crews in the heat of the moment as the American prize crew boarded, both crews seemed to settle in and get along quite well. To quote Leach again, I soon found myself perfectly at home with the American seamen, so much that I chose to mess with them. My shipmates also participated in similar feelings in both ships. All idea that we had been trying to shoot each other's brains out so shortly before seemed forgotten. We ate together, drank together, joked, sung, laughed, told yarns, in short, a perfect union of ideas, feelings and purposes seemed to exist among all hands. Although relatively undamaged, the chance to bring in a prize this good was far too good to pass up, so United States made good her own minimal repairs and then sailed in company with the Macedonian for the US East Coast. And whilst in company, it transpired that apparently part of Cardin's tactics came from having from somehow mistaken the rather large United States for the much smaller and carronade-armed USS Essex. Whether you believe that or not, or whether you think that Cardon was just trying to cover for himself after the fact, I leave up to you. In any event, the ships eventually made landfall. Sources actually disagree, believe it or not, on this particular sequence of events, but the primary sources from the time seem to, in, at least in aggregate, to suggest to me that at New London, Connecticut, the United States entered harbour, but the wind then almost immediately shifted, and after a few hours trying to get in as well, the Macedonian bore northeast for Newport. Both ships then seemed to have headed down the coast for New York shortly thereafter, and Macedonian was brought into service as USS Macedonian and fully repaired. This was, however, the end of the war for both ships. A bit later on, whilst trying to sneak out of New York past the British blockade, they ran into a force consisting of a 74-gun ship of the line, a Razade frigate, and a regular frigate, and were forced to run. This coming after the United States had been struck by lightning. Both ships found themselves holed up in New London again, and would remain there for the rest of the war, although their armament and some of their fittings would eventually be sent up to the Great Lakes to fight there, and both ships would be rearmed and see service after the War of 1812 was over back on the high seas, with the US Navy, where possible, making a point of greeting patrolling British warships with the now USS Macedonian wherever possible. Although the Royal Navy had now lost two fifth-rate frigates to the larger American super frigates, it took a very different view of the two engagements. Captain Dacra of the Guerriere was found to have done all he could, and after being exchanged back and cleared at his court-martial, he was actually back at sea and in command of the brand new 38-gun HMS Tiber, well before the War of 1812 was even over. Cardin, meanwhile, was strongly criticised at his court-martial, and although technically cleared, the Royal Navy never gave him another at-sea command. 
A Decatur, meanwhile, after some time locked up in New London, would be transferred to take command of the slightly less blockaded USS President, which he would command on another voyage, which we'll cover a little bit further down the line. <laughs> 